Okay. Hi, folks. Um, I have returned. Nice. Thanks. Ideally victorious. So uh, I am about to show you. Uh, I will begin sharing my screen with you now. Do, do, do. Here we are. Okay. Is everybody able to see my screen? Yeah, yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. I'm going to close all the little faces because I find it distracting uh, to see everybody's face. So uh, good afternoon, uh, I suppose, or good morning, folks. Um, thank you very much for coming and joining this uh, artist talk today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this recent body of work I have been uh, creating, uh, working on, essentially uh, under the name of Do You Dream? Uh, Do You Also Dream of Clear Cuts? And essentially, this show is uh, an attempt to present primary resource extraction on the landscape and its role in solastalgia as artifacts of ecological grief. And we'll be covering some of that vocabulary in, a, in the future slides here. But uh, essentially, I've been going and collecting wild clay uh, from post-human landscapes around uh, BC or so-called BC uh, and firing it in a pit, essentially with waste from clear cuts. Uh, you know, living in BC, it's something that we are very aware of and something that we see a lot of. If you've ever been out towards Souk or up into the northern part of the island, you will have passed by a clear cut in a, uh, invariably. Uh, the process demands heavy physical labor and what has come to mind is that it forces reflection on the human labor expended by these industries and you know it calls to mind stories of things like logging accidents and its uh its effects on on the humans the human cost as well as the uh, ecological cost of uh these industries so what is ecological grief essentially ecological grief also known as climate grief is a psychological response to loss caused by environmental uh, destruction or climate change. It is a newer concept uh, that has recently had words put to it, but it is not a new feeling. Um, you know, we have, this is something that has been experienced by people uh, since, you know, since rapid industrialization, perhaps before. So nostalgia, on the other hand, is an emotional or existential distress caused by lived experience of negative environmental change in a home environment where one is still at home but home has been irrevoc irrevocably altered um i think anyone who has left their hometown for a while and gone back and seen that it has completely changed uh has experienced this to some extent um especially those of us who grew up in more natural environments or near near forests or things like that that have been uh, developed or you know taken into uh, you know uh, subdivisions or just used in that general way. Uh, Solastalgia, though, it's it's a broader concept uh, and again a newer a sort of newer piece of vocabulary. So we can't talk about ecological grief, or I can't talk about ecological grief without first um, talking about the Amazon. Uh, this is a photo uh, of the Peruvian side of the Amazon taken from the Colombian side. And in 2016, I took my second trip there uh, to visit some friends, some friends of mine who lived in community, and to facilitate a photography workshop uh, and was fortunate enough to be invited to stay with a family in the village of San Martín de Amacayacu, uh, which is about, well, depends on the, if it's rainy season, it's an hour and a half up a tributary. If it's dry season, it's like three and a half hours. Uh, and learn ceramics from a, uh, from my host's mother-in-law, basically. He, you know, I was staying with this family and he was like, oh, you do ceramics. My, my mother-in-law does ceramics. Do you want to like, learn from her a little bit do you want to do you want her to teach you a little bit and I said if she has the patience for me so uh this is my my mentor this is Doña Grimanesa um who is honestly the fastest coil builder I have ever encountered if anybody has done coil building in ceramics you know it is a long and laborious process and she does it no problem uh she also does she was telling me about uh when I was working with her 
about how she uh, she takes her canoe up river and she will dig the clay herself and process it herself, which is really heavy duty work. So, you know, she's in her probably mid seventies now and uh, it's definitely uh, definitely labor intensive. Her stuff is, is beautiful and perfect. I'm lucky enough to have bought a couple pieces. So these early forays, basically, uh, spending the day just sort of patiently uh it's it was very much a watch and listen kind of uh learning process which is uh common there is you do you watch and you don't really ask a whole lot of questions you just watch and listen and they'll sort of you know tell you stuff as you go uh was quail building and then polishing these pieces with a coconut seed uh, a tool which i still use to burnish a lot of my pieces so Upon returning to Canada, oh, there she is uh, firing, firing stuff in the pit. You can see she, she, we had it burned down to coals and uh, there's my piece there to the, uh, to the right and hers on the left, which is significantly nicer than mine. This is the, was, this was the piece that was made. Uh, so uh, it's made with the Amazonian red clay, uh, which has this really beautiful color quality to it. Uh, and then afterwards we sealed it with tree resin to make it watertight. I still probably wouldn't put water in it uh, just because I'm afraid of it melting away. Uh, so I'm not quite so, quite so perfect in that technique, but it's a piece that was probably the beginning of this whole process. So upon returning to Canada, I was disconnected for a while from wild earth until I was trying to figure out with uh, what to do with these cool rocks and dirt that I have a tendency to hoard. Uh, I, you know, if I find a cool patch of dirt, for example, um, a couple of years ago, my family and I, we went to Utah and I got, I brought back a water bottle full of sand from Arches National Park. And I'm like, what do I do with this? It's so cool, but it's just here. Until I remembered a book uh, it's a book called Color by Victoria Finlay. Uh, if you are interested in the history of pigment, I highly, highly recommend it. It's fascinating. And they have, uh, she has this chapter, this whole chapter that is devoted to the use of ochre in art, specifically by the uh, Aboriginal peoples of Australia and the Northern Territory of Australia, where the earth is very, very iron rich. I started thinking about that. I was like, that's really cool, but I don't even know where to start. And then serendipitously, a, um, a workshop came available with the artist Caitlin French, who makes watercolor paints out of earth pigments. And it seemed like just a slightly more, you know, meaningful souvenir of a place rather than, you know, purchasing another tchotchke. Uh, and to find uh, a, a different kind of connection to a place. So here's some, here's some rocks from Comox, actually, from the beach on Co uh, Balmoral Beach on Comox. Um, the best way to find if a stone is going to produce a good pigment is you either dunk it in water or you lick it if you're gross like me and you scribble it against another rock that is slightly harder and if it leaves a color, uh, color trace, then you have a pigment. So gathering wild materials is not only about the materials themselves, but understanding the relationships between natural forces that shift and move and shape a landscape over unfathomable periods of time. And it serves as a reminder that we are temporary visitors evolutionarily on a very, very, very old earth. When we think of geologic time, we are thinking in periods of time that are really hard to grasp. Uh, and a lot of this work is an attempt to grasp it. So as I got more into collecting my art materials from the earth, it created that situation to reflect on just this, these processes, these greater processes than myself, as well as personal geography and the familiarity of certain materials and plants, the things that we all recognize or we learn when we're little kids, you know, things like, oh, a dandelion or, oh, a cedar or things like that. And also examine the unfamiliarity when you go to other places. For example, uh, this uh, summer we had the opportunity to visit some of the Eastern Woodland in Ontario. And it was amazing because I didn't know what anything was. And I loved that. I thought it was so fabulous to just to have the unfamiliarity and to familiarize yourself with those components, with that land and that those plants, right? So 
I hadn't really given much thought to clear cuts other than feeling sad when I saw them until about 2019, when I was invited to do a residency at Tassas Farm, uh, which is up on Moachat and Chilat territory on the west coast of Vancouver Island, sort of if you guys know where uh, Cayucat is and Tofino is, it's between there, up an inlet. Um, and during that time, I thought very much about it. It's during active logging season, you see it every single day. Uh, to get to Tassis, you have to drive three hours down a logging road. It's just, it's the forest service road that is maintained by Western Forest Products. And you have to often move to the side so you don't get punted by a logging truck over a cliff, right, when you're driving. Um, and you also see, you know, going into the cuts, you see a lot of this kind of stuff. You see these slash piles and these waste piles, which is, you know, stuff from camp, it's burned material. And a lot of it is really good wood that has just been left to sort of rot away and molder. And uh, the friend of mine who I was staying with, a sculptor called Troy Moff, uh, he scavenges a lot of this waste wood and he creates wooden sculptures out of it. And so joining him up in the cuts was really, uh, really an interesting process to sort of you know, witness the waste and also be able to take things out of it. Now, it is coming back from this residency trip that I pulled over at a particularly raw cut block and took this self portrait with my film camera, which uh, I have always traveled with. You know, my parents gave it to me when I'm when I was 12 and I have been taking it everywhere since. The photos in this exhibition were all shot with that with that same camera and I just feel like it has um, the processing of film has a little bit more of a tactile element to it that echoes well with my artistic practice. But um, I would say this is the photograph that might have uh, sparked this whole project. Uh, nowadays, since then, most times when I know when I'm going to be passing by a cut or a burn pile, for example, uh, when my partner and I go up foraging for mushrooms or whatever, I try to shoot a couple of pictures. It is a way of bearing witness to the results of the primary resource industry, the effects of ecology, and an attempt to freeze a moment in time in a deeply unstable landscape. It also turns out that if you spend a bunch of time in clear cuts, you find a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, bones is a common one. Uh, we have also found a throwing axe. We have found, uh, you know, I found bird eggshells, all sorts of, it's, it's one of those places where everything is stripped away and you can see all the little layers and these little components underneath that you wouldn't necessarily notice. So interesting in that way. I returned to Tassis in 2020 uh, and completely focused this time on ceramics, particularly the gathering of what some call wild clay uh, from disturbed areas such as road cuts and, uh, and cut blocks, riverbanks, things like that. Uh, I have to give credit to my friend Celine, who saved me a big like dog food bag full of clay from her hometown in Kitwanga, which is uh, up in, in Gitsan territory up north. Um, some of the pieces from made that year are the same that you see in this room today. Uh, some of them exploded, unfortunately, in the pit firing, but that is just how it happens. This is the Kitwanga clay, which has the most fabulous color. Um, it is also silky smooth. When you dip your hand into it, it feels like a mud mask, but uh, surprisingly, it fires golden brown. So when you put it into the firing, it turns golden brown. So really, really fascinating there. Some pieces uh, inspired by the craggy ridges around Tassus. Some, you know, concept, concept paintings. Now, Wild clay is notoriously persnickety. Uh, it has all sorts of imperfections and quirks and each one is different and you have to work, you have to work with it. You cannot try to bend it to your will. Otherwise it's not going to end well. It's going to, you know, it has things like firing limits and it has organic matter and has different mineral contents. And sometimes it really wants to explode and sometimes it really wants to melt into a puddle. And, you know, it doesn't want to be your friend unlike commercial clay. But um, it basically means that you must test and test and test and test. So here are some test tiles that I have made. Uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, 100% mix and then I have a 50-50 with uh, commercial clay. And as you can see, after the firing, the changing, uh, the bisque firing, the color change can be quite, uh, quite surprising. 
So Salina and Troy very graciously let me dig a very large pit on their property and uh, basically uh, collect trash from the cuts. And uh, you know we did a big pullout of Scotch broom, that, inv that terrible invasive plant, and we just burned a ton of it in this uh, you know six six foot by four foot pit. And the wonderful thing about pit firing, the reason that I love it, is that basically it is a, a perfectly viable artistic technique to take a bunch of organic trash and throw it in a pit and, uh, and set it on fire. So, um, and what comes out of it is art with a ton of character. So as you can see, uh, what I've done is I've, um, here is I've created a bed of sawdust from the mill. They have a little mill site. Um, you know, we've got dry grasses, all sorts of things. Also, also threw in a number of uh, pieces of copper wire, copper trash, things like that. There it is going. At certain points, it gets so hot that you can't really be near it. You have to stand several feet back and sort of poke at things with a, a big long stick. And you must let it burn all the way down. And in this case, because it was such a large pit, it needed to cool overnight. Uh, when the pieces emerge, it is either tragic because they have broken or exploded, or it is absolutely wonderful, like this little cup here uh, that I was very, very happy with. Um, it is a long process and it is a dirty process, but that's half of the fun, honestly. So nowadays, I you know I can't I haven't been able to get up to Tassis for a while, and so now I generally fire in the day use area in Goldstream uh, surreptitiously. Um, now and since summer 2020, I have been regularly going out uh, on forays to search for clay and firing materials in the cuts, usually around the souk area. Uh, this can include gathering general slash like twigs and branches, uh, wood that is already semi burned from a burn pile or the trash that is left behind. Um, this is me with my trusty Rubbermaid bin. Beer cans are a common one that you find, uh, mostly from recreational users of the, uh, of the, the area. And the photos included in this show are largely images of the material gathering process, uh, i.e. pictures of me dragging around large pieces of, uh, and, of and soggy chunks of wood, in some cases, smiling at a wren. And others show the pieces uh, as they are being pit fired. So here's a, a picture of one of the pieces. One of this one actually sadly blew up. Uh, you know, I flew too close to the sun and tried to fire it twice. Uh, in, in the pit fire. However, when collecting these materials, it is hard not to become bogged down by the scale of what one is seeing, right? Um, this is in Tassus. I'm actually in this photo. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm there. <laughs> looking, looking very small in the scale, uh, you know, person, human for scale, banana for scale. Um, and just the, the, you know, the waste of it and the shockingness of it, it, it kind of feels like being punched in the gut over and over and over again. It's hard not to see it and feel it in that way if you are at all interested in or connected to, to the natural environment. Now, the clay itself is not the only thing that has been incorporated into pieces in this show. Uh, I've been working a fair amount with uh, scorch, scorch wood um, using a blowtorch essentially to apply a, uh, a scorch to it. This is a technique called shosugiban uh, that was uh, developed by the Japanese to actually insect proof wood because it, it actually makes it pretty insect proof and a little bit waterproof. So it's pretty fascinating. Um, it attempts to imitate the burn piles, the character of those burn piles. Another one. Additionally, I have recently learned from a friend how to make cordage, um, which is very exciting. Uh, it's, it's very fun. And I now know what I'm gonna be doing uh, at staff meetings every, every week going forward. Uh, I have made some, in this case, out of fireweed and cattail. Uh, the, in the pieces that it's used in, it helps to provide sort of a softening element to an otherwise very like hard or very plain piece. Um, it's surprisingly strong fireweed cordage. You can you can really like yard on it, and it and it will not spray, um, snap. Now the use of the fireweed is pretty purposeful in that it is often the first plant to come up after a cut or a burn, basically. So hence fireweed it springs up, and uh, and starts to sort of remediate remediate that soil. 
And lastly, and most recently, I have explored applying beeswax to some of these pieces. Um, old growth forests actually host the highest diversity of arthropods and their cutting and their, their sort of the raising of old growth forests without much regard for it is, uh, is impacting insects in ways that are largely unseen, including pollinators. Uh, and unfortunately, when we affect insect populations, we affect plant diversity as well. So hence the, uh, the beeswax. Um, it also serves very well as a crack repair, uh, I will say, for, for pit firing if you've ever done some. So I will now open up the floor to, to questions and come back to speaker view here. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Simone, what, what inspired you to, to do this kind of work? What, I mean, I, you said you went to the Amazon and I saw that you, you know, you learned from that woman, but what, what, what made you think that, um, I guess what inspired you from the, seeing the clear cuts and to do this particular project? Uh, a big piece of it is that the, so clear cuts are because of, for example, accelerated erosion and growth decay processes. There is, there's kind of an ephemerality to the landscapes and it was an attempt to try to like preserve a snapshot of it in a way that wasn't necessarily a photograph as well as to respond to those feelings of ecological grief around the clear cutting of, of our forests here in BC, um, which makes, you know, it makes our landscape so distinctive. Yeah, it's a really beautiful work and, and I love, I love the thought you've put into it. It's, it's amazing. It's really interesting. Thanks, mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Uh, okay, uh, I see a hand up from Ingrid and a hand up from Sylvia. That's Colin Brown, right? Oh, and also from Catherine. Let's go, Ingrid, first. Sorry, one moment. Hi. Um, fantastic work. Really, really wonderful to hear your um, your your process and see some of the pieces related to um, like the mixed media, mixed technique, absolutely fantastic, beautiful work. Um, I had some nerdier questions about things related to, for instance, the um, like your, what are you planning on doing in the future? There's so many different variations in terms of looking at it from a more, like from a, a technical view, the beauty of this is in its ephemerality, but I'm wondering if you have, for instance, for beeswax, have you considered using that as like a resist, you know marrying different sites you know is there like I want to know more I want to know what your next project is so that's uh I guess <laughs> so fair enough um yeah I actually do have another show coming up in the springtime in uh in May and that one is uh more it's ceramics and painting because the earth pigments as well that I've turned into watercolor um that's going to be it's going to be a little bit more focused on watersheds that's kind of the next and uh, and basically how erosion and um, you know soil instability is affecting watersheds and especially salmon stocks. How it's you know everything is interconnected and when you look at you can't look at one thing at ecology without looking at a billion other things. As I you know tell my students every single day. Um, as for this particular ceramic project, I want to get out this summer when I am off from my teaching job. My plan is to drive around BC and basically just collect a whole whack of weird clay and wild clay and pigments and see what I can do with it and see, you know, I've taken a small workshop as well with uh, for additives um, to clay like granite and sand and quartz from a, uh, an artist who is doing a lot of stuff like this in Minnesota. Uh, so I'm hoping to incorporate some of that skill as well. Uh, as for the beeswax, actually one of the parents at my school is a beekeeper and she keeps her hives out in the cuts. So I'm hoping to source some beeswax from her because uh, she'll have the, you know, her honey labeled with the cut block name quite often, you know. Uh, she, she's at the Moss Street Market, so quick plug for uh, Sweet Caroline's Bees there. Uh, but that's another part that I'm hoping to, to bring in to source it a little bit more, more locally. But I mean, I have, I have so many projects that are wanting to relate back to this. You know, there's another project that I'm hoping to do uh, that is more audio based with bird calls of uh, bird species that are uh, affected by old growth logging, such as the marbled marillette and the, uh, the Northern goshawk. 
um, organisms like that, Western screech owl, of course, but uh, you know, these things require time and, and, and research. So for now, the focus is more around, around the dirt. Uh, let's go Sylvia next, and then we'll go to Catherine. First off, uh, hi Simone. I am so impressed by your passion, your knowledge and your creativity just blows my mind. It's just incredible. And so I guess my question, so congratulations. So my question is around clear cutting and that more of us are more aware even within the industry, right? That there is movement for change. Do you feel a little optimistic um, as to the future of, of the clear cuts that are here and, and, and the future of our logging, but also, and how, how much more can you use your artistry to tie in with that movement? So I am hoping to do a visit at some point to Ferry Creek. Uh, I didn't get a chance to this summer, but the logging, uh, the logging protests out in Fort Renfrew, but also to visit communities where logging is a, a a really integral part of the economy and often the only living that people can make. I'm really hoping to connect with people who do work in the industry to get a little bit more of a nuanced view on this rather than just my own opinion and my own feelings. This is very much my own response. Um, and I recognize that that's not the only facet to this debate and this issue, uh, especially when we're talking really remote areas uh, where you know they haven't, there hasn't been an opportunity for other types of sustainable income for people necessarily. Uh, sometimes it's hard to feel optimistic. What does make me feel optimistic is talking about these kind of topics with my students. Um, the trick will be to leave enough for us for them to protect in the future uh, and for them to enjoy because their view is very different from, you know, my generation even. Uh, it's, it's, as to the preservation and what their priorities are uh, in terms of, you know, carbon sequestration and things, uh, uh, you know, biodiversity. Um, and it may be, you know, for some people, it may be an overly simplified or overly optimistic view that 11 to 13 year olds have. But for me, I say, why not, right? Why can't we have that vision? Why can't we have that dream of, uh, of having these old growth forests, these wide swaths of old growth forests for people to, to enjoy in the future. Uh, let's pop over to Catherine. Oh, you're muted. And mute. Good yeah. morning, Simon. I'm um, Sylvia's cousin. And uh, I, I used to do a bit of pottery, so I was uh, ecstatic to, to join your, your, your Zoom. And uh, congratulations for uh, this adventure. I think you're, you're full of imagination and you inspire me. Uh, next to, um, at the end of my road is uh, Gospel Rock, and it is unfortunately been a clear cutting. It was supposed to be a development, and with COVID and whatnot, it's nothing is happening, but the clear cut has been done. And I did notice clay, a mm -hmm. lot of clay. So my question is, um, I'm, I'm amazed, you, you seem to be a, a, a small woman. How do you carry this clay? Because um, I would love to carry some clay and, and be adventurous like you are doing stuff and put it in the fire, even if it breaks. <laughs> um, but uh, what do you use, a, a wheelbarrow or your shoulders or how do you carry that clay? So and how much do you carry at a time? So, I mean, I have my partner, Simon, who is a really, really, you know, he is extremely helpful and humors me endlessly in uh, helping me carry buckets of clay. It's also the only reason I really go to the gym is so that I can carry more clay and get stronger, <laughs> uh, get beefier for carrying more clay. But yeah, basically it's, the nice thing is, is that try a little at a time. First, yeah. so like collect like a pound of clay and test that first. And then if you want more, you can always go back for more. Yeah. But often I'll just collect, you know, a, a couple chunks like that size 
Yeah. And then if you want to, uh, if you want to explore it, I generally find it becomes a lot easier to use if you sieve it to get all the organic materials and junk out and then let it dry and then try to wedge it and see. Best way to see if a piece of clay is going to be promising for use is if you, you know, find clay out in the wild, you roll it into a coil, into a little snake, and then you bend it into a circle. And if it cracks everywhere, it's, you know, it's still usable. It's just going to be a real pain. But if it doesn't crack a lot, then it has good plasticity and it's going to be a lot easier to build with. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Smallest sieve size is probably, uh, it's a mining sieve. I think it's 100 or 150. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I have two. I have the 50 mesh for the like big stuff. And then I have the 150 for, for really fine stuff. If you go to a mining store or like a, you know, those like gold panning and like crystal hobby stores, they have those, they have mining sieves for gold panning and they work amazingly. Yeah. They work super well. Amazing. Yeah. So you could do it. Um, I see another hand up from Ingrid and maybe another one from Sylvia here. Um, because your work is so rooted in ecological grief and also in resonance with the land, um, what if, you know, since I think this kind of work um, will inspire, you know, the more people hear about your work and others like you doing similar work, do you have any advice for um, respectful gathering of materials, permitting for burning, things like that, resources that you would like to maybe share with the audience or where you can direct people to uh, do this respectfully and safely? Yeah, especially um, if you are collecting on the side of the road, because actually roads are where you will find a lot of wild material, ideally uh, wear bright clothing. <laughs> Make sure that you are really visible. Um, generally, because I, you know, I have a privilege as a you know a white lady um if i'm grubbing around in the dirt on the side of the road people don't usually ask me what i'm doing um you know uh or you know for example um it's good to it's it is good to ask permission uh in the clear cuts i don't always ask permission i will say i just go up there uh because a lot of these places are used as hiking trails and and things anywhere there anyway um but there's always the the um the possibility of just being like, hey, you know, just say, uh, call the logging company and say, hey, may I forage on your land? Uh, and especially if you are going to be um, gathering on Indigenous territory, it's really important to follow protocol and call first. Uh, call the band office or ask permission. Um, you know, be aware of those land tenures and those land borders and just make sure that you're doing your due diligence and being respectful. Because sometimes they might say no. Uh, and that's okay. And you know, sometimes there are, for example, ochre gathering spots that I just, I just know that I will not, I don't feel comfortable accessing um, because it's historical, you know, uh, historical gathering place for sacred ochre. That I'm just going to be like hands off because I don't feel like I have a right to be there. But you know, a lot of people are afraid to ask. The worst thing people can say is no, right? And it's, it's, you just have to be, to be okay with that. Um, for safety in the cuts, uh, be very aware um, is a big one. Be very aware. Wear good shoes. Um, the terrain is is not good. Uh, it's you. You gotta watch. You know. You can easily twist an ankle. You can also get pretty scratched up uh, gathering stuff like this. So just just be being careful. Um, for resources for burn permits. Uh, it's easier if you live in a rural area because you can burn garden waste in rural areas. Like for example, where I live in Saanich, I am not allowed to start a bonfire in my backyard, which is very sad. So if you have a friend who lives in a rural area or you, for example, um, have a, uh, or, or if you can find a campsite, a campsite's usually a pretty good place to do a pit fire in because um, they're not gonna really ask you a lot of questions if you have, uh, if you have a fire going for a good couple of hours. Uh, I see a question uh, from, did I see Sylvia, do you have your hand up? Oh, okay, so from Max there. Hello. Um, Hello. The small in the work looks really incredible and um, I'm really blown away and can't wait to see all the pieces in person. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll, I'll start with one and then maybe we can move on to someone else and I can ask the other one another time. But. Um, with a lot of like really great art, it comes from a place of sort of like confrontation 
or you know depression or sort of like grief and with with conventional art like paintings and stuff like that it's a little bit easier to file those feelings away <clears throat> in an archive but with physical pieces where it's a little bit harder and you might be sort of like encountering them on a day-to-day -day basis do you find that sometimes like the creation of these pieces for you is more sort of uh liberating and like you you sort of feel like you're transferring grief into a physical object or do you also find these pieces sometimes kind of hard to face because they sort of represent um your feelings on on clear cuts and sort of like ecological damage so the ceramics actually really help with the processing because it is a very meditative process um especially coil building. Coil building, it's this very like slow, ponderous sort of, you know, you, you pick at it for a little while and then you have to step away from it because you have to wait for your lower, lower coil to dry. And so that patience and that slowness, I find is really helpful with the processing. Um, the parts of it that I do find hard in terms of having to face it is if I'm going, when I'm going through my photos. Um, because, you know, photographing a lot of that stuff, it just sort of like, reignites those feelings every time you're like oh yeah that horrible clear cup cut up on you know tassus main or like this one where i found like a you know a bunch of dead baby swallows or you know whatever um it it reconfronts you with those feelings but i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing i don't think that that's unhealthy i think there's a i mean there's a real people don't like ugly emotions People don't like grief and they don't like depression and they don't like uh, rage, but I don't think it's necessarily unhealthy to feel those until you, uh, unless you're seeking it out, right? Um, but it's important to acknowledge those feelings and to, you know, through art, I feel like that's the, probably the best way that I can acknowledge it. For me, it's healthier. Otherwise I just sort of like sit with it. Like a, you know, I just, I hold this big rock that is my rage and grief and then I can't put it down. Um, so, it's a way of sort of breaking that, you know, that, so to speak, rock into smaller pieces. Uh, I see a question from Connie and from mom and dad. <laughs> Hi, Simone. So great to see you and to hear you talk and see the work. I, I love seeing it and you, you're such a great speaker. It's awesome to hear you speak. Um, I'm wondering, you know, I've spent a lot of time myself in clear cut spaces over the last year or two and I'm just wondering if you've noticed any particular species um, sort of being the first to pop up in those spaces because I guess this last summer that's something that I paid particular attention to like I was like oh look I keep seeing wasps inside blast holes or I keep seeing you know like so I was wondering if you actually noticed particular species um there when you're when you're in the spaces yeah so fireweed being the, the the big one but also i mean salal comes back pretty quickly um as do certain hardy types of ferns uh definitely uh trailing blackberry and himalayan blackberry you know you'll never get rid of them they're everywhere uh and of course that's broom to an extent as for Insect species, it's something that I'm trying to notice more because, uh, I mean, I'm guilty of just sort of ignoring that, uh, that sort of, you know, that whole kingdom or that whole phylum arthropoda, um, but trying to notice a little bit more of that. One thing I do notice a lot of is, is, um, is birds. So uh, robins and other thrush species and ground foraging birds, you see them a fair amount. You know, I encounter, or wrens, right? Pacific wrens, I encounter a fair amount. Um, which is always delightful because they're just sort of this like little brown puffy ball and they sort of like tumble out of the bush and they're like, what are you doing? Uh, <laughs> so very, very delightful. Um, as well as reptiles, so snakes and uh, more recently the European wall lizards, I do see them once in a while, but garter snakes a lot, especially in the early spring, the young ones, um, when they come out of hibernation, we see a lot of garter snakes in the cuts. Thank you. The birds are really interesting because they reseed that space. Right, yeah. they, their their poop really ends up reseeding and bringing other species in, so they're super interesting. Thank you. Okay, let's go to uh, Matt and Paula. You gotta unmute yourself, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> 
Paula, todavía está de mute. You're, you're, you're still muted. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's your question? No, I was just saying that I wanted to say hi to everybody. It's nice to see familiar faces. But also, um, I just wanted to say that the photography you showed was uh, really powerful and and really adds to the work. Uh, I don't know if because we're not at the gallery, unfortunately, um, if you also did some prints that are up with the show, but I think that that um, yeah, I just, I was really taken aback by them, especially the one with you sort of uh, draped on some of the clear cut, like, yeah, it just, it just really speaks to um, the trauma of the landscape. Like it's traumatic to see it. And, and I think a lot of us don't get to see that. I mean, we've seen small clear cuts, but I mean, I think, you know, you see land being cleared here and there, but um, I think that, um, yeah, those, those images are really powerful. And I'd love to see you take this exhibition to Vancouver. Um, and, and I'm wondering if there's, you know, if as an artist, if you have looked into, um, you know, having this exhibition uh, in other places, of, you know, across Canada or even, you know, Vancouver. Um, because I think what you're talking about is really interesting and really important and, um, yeah, I, I, I love I love the work. I love I love the whole concept of what you've brought together here, and I, it's it's really uh it's really interesting and really uh really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I definitely have considered it. It is something that I'm hoping to do. I'm actually in the process of like writing a grant to get funding to do a, a bit more work around this and to hopefully present um, in other places in Canada. Uh, as yeah. as well, hopefully, um, yeah. I'm hoping I'm hoping to continue this body of work because it feels like a good a good thread to follow. Yeah, uh, yeah, Mitha. Um, do you foresee using additional materials in the circuit? I know they're doing certification of the board and the body. Yeah. Are there additional items that could be of use? Maybe. Um, I'm one of the. Can you repeat? Can you repeat Medha's question because we couldn't hear it. Oh yeah, she's saying if I'm uh, intending to use other materials from the clear cuts other than like the cordage and things. Uh, yeah, definitely. I, you know, I hope to figure out ways how to incorporate more of those components into the clay, uh, whether that be minerals or you know sand from a from a little culvert. Um, it's just going to require a fair amount of testing. The only issue is that um, organic material tends to burn out in the kiln, so. Trying to find a way to marry those would be really interesting. Uh, another piece is, um, is, is, you know, continuing with the sort of burned wood theme uh, and maybe ash and uh, creating ash glazes. Yeah. It's, um, I just wanted to add one thing. It's, it's interesting. Someone, hold on, someone. Yeah, yeah, I have. So um, basically the pieces that you see in this room that are like slightly more brown, that's wild clay from the cups. Yeah. Um, Dad, you had a question? Yeah, Dad, Dad has a question. No, I was just going to say it's really interesting that um, we're in the in the Baja in Mexico right now, and we've recently um, purchased a piece of raw land, and we're trying to situate um, a home on it. And of the plants that are on the land, and this 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 land's never been touched before. I would say half of the plants that are on this piece of property are completely protected. Mm. You can't touch them. And I thought that's really interesting compared to, I don't really know of any plant species in Canada where they treat it that way. There's Arbutus, Arbutus is one, there's a few, but um, few. yeah, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, when you look at a, for example, a native plant book, we have, you know, things like our native jewel orchid or things that are really particular and endemic to our area, um, that it would be great if they were protected, but they're sadly not, uh, you know, it's because it doesn't, it doesn't really serve it. Uh, I feel like it doesn't serve, serve economically as much to protect, to protect plants too heavily. Um, yeah. But yeah, uh, go ahead. 
Alberta federal. Really? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I know, I mean, I know of this the Federal Species at Risk Act, but I didn't know we didn't have a provincial one. Yeah. Which is crazy because um, so recently, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I highly recommend you Google it because it's truly fascinating. Uh, it was a map of uh, sort of a heat map of endemic species to Canada and BC was like bright red. We have so many BC endemics and even on the island we have endemics, right? Like, uh, you know, for example, the, um, the Vancouver Island marmot, you know, that very charismatic little chubby animal uh, is, is an endemic. And the thing is, is that a lot of these endemics are plants and people, it is harder for people to connect with plants than it is with, uh, you know, with a cute little animal. But um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, ooh, that's something to look more into. Thank you for that. Um, we got a hand up from Ingrid and a hand up from Connie. Uh, could be worth looking into the Craft Council of BC. They have a gallery space and a couple, of, and one of them is a window display, but the window display is um, shorter than others. But I think that your pieces would do very well there. And also it would, um, they do do BC based artist exhibitions and touring shows. And of course, you know about the, um, the Arts Council, like across Canada road shows, please take this on the road. I think that having, you know, Western Canadian, um, like, art, uh, specifically your, um, your communion with, uh, with between your, uh, the, the actual land-based grief you have here and also the land-based process is something that won't exist past the shield uh, or not in its current form because we have different forests. So um, maybe it might farther north, but at least in Ontario and Montreal, it might be quite different based on the actual species there. So it could be really valuable, um, yeah. I hope to. I'd love to. I'd love to do like a you know across Canada sort of sort of show and uh, yeah. yeah, travel to different places. Um, Noan, we have about six minutes left. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any final questions? Um, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you for having us here, and I was wondering, you talked a little bit about it in your presentation, but. How do you find your work relates to the ongoing uh, protest and situation at Ferry Creek? Uh, I feel like it's parallel for sure, uh, because I haven't spent any time there actually. Uh, I find that I'm, I'm not able to truly connect it, but I feel like it raises similar concerns. And, uh, you know, there's that, that protest and the, you know, the, the, the grief and the anger that is driving that, you know, no more uh, sort of, you know, the attitude of, of no more and that's enough, you know, we're sick of seeing these, these forests raised uh, is, is similar for sure. I would, I would really like to spend some time up there um, and, uh, and, you know, do my part as, as well and, uh, and talk to people because, you know, when, you, when you're doing this kind of work, alone, you become a bit of an echo chamber, but to hear other people's take on it, I think is really important as well. And uh, especially the people who are out there year round uh, and fully like living out at the protests. Um, yeah, I would really love to to get their take on it and get their, their engaged with, um, with sort of a broader perspective around it as well. Society would like to uh, wrap up with a statement, and then if I can get my screen shared, I can walk around and show the pieces to the home. Yeah, that sounds great. So, uh, so Cindy's gonna Cindy's gonna share her screen in a moment, and I would also just like to take a second to um, thank you, Simone. What an awesome presentation! Learned so much today, and really great dialogue with everybody in the audience. So, thank you and congratulations. I would like to also invite you to use your presentation to create a blog post for the exchanges website. Sure. And uh, let's get, a, get that up. You and I can work on that offline, but um, fabulous content and, and just really great. And I would also just like to thank um, and acknowledge our funders um, who are supporting exchanges, artists, gallery and studios. So that would be the Capital Regional District. We receive a small operating grant from them and the um, province of British Columbia through the BC Gaming Grant. So thank you both to those sponsors and also um, Opus Art Supplies, who are a great sponsor of the um, 
Exchanges Gallery as well. So thank you. So Cindy, are you ready to share your your uh, phone? Let's see if this works. <laughs> okay. Um, can start for us. I can. I'll, I'll ask you to start your video. Here we go. Oh, looks like screen sharing. It's just it's thinking about it. No, I'm trying. Yeah, just click OK. Just hit OK. Just hit OK. Yeah, we ask so much of our technology. I know. I about this I know. Every day. I'm just like, oh, how can I not screen share streaming videos while I'm having just, we Zoom just on? Wi -Fi. We just got the Wi Fi all upgraded to it exchanges. It was a huge expense, but we needed to do it. Will we be able to send this presentation to friends and family? Yeah, uh, yeah will, we are recording it. We are recording it, and it'll take us a while, but we will get it um, up on our YouTube channel. And then uh, the link will be available on Simone's artist page as well. So oh, stay tuned great. for that. We'll let you know when that's all ready. Cindy, I think you okay, just need to you turn your camera that. on the top left. It says switch camera. You can just flip it. Uh, yeah, I know, but nothing's happening, period. Hmm. I guess stop sharing. Well, I might be able to share because I have a webcam yeah, and your, then I can probably yeah, just use my computer. Your yeah, so turn your that. Machine. Okay, so and everybody else is sharing my screen. Share your video, so you need to share it. Yeah, yeah. just gotta yeah. figure out how to share my my video here. Hmm. Okay. Just turn the camera around because we can see you. We can oh, you can see me. Okay, good. Yeah. Technology. Okay. So I will. Uh, Shakily move this around. There's have to figure out how to drive okay, so this. You one. can see one. That's great. There's this one. Um, so here is the gallery space as it stands at the moment, nice. with several uh, pieces with prints of the photographs as well. You don't have to. You don't have to walk. You can just turn the camera. Yeah. Oh, just pan it. Yeah, just pan it. That's great. <coughs> So we can see the folks. Hi, folks. <laughs> Just keep going. Three sixty-five. There's nothing on the wall behind me here, but uh, there's a gallery. Nice. It's okay, Cindy. Cindy's still trying to share. Okay. Just Simon. For anybody who knows him. There we go. But yes, here's yeah. Here's a very disorienting camera view of the show. Yep. <laughs> well, it gives us an idea anyway. Yeah. So, and I'll also, if, uh, for those of you who follow me on Instagram, um, I have pictures and videos of the show that I'll be posting up there. So you'll be able to see it a little better. That's great. All right, folks. Is anybody um, gonna, Moni, is anybody going to do any uh, coverage on it? Any uh, local papers or anything? Not as far as I know, uh, not to my knowledge at least, but um, yeah, if you know anybody who wants to, <laughs> send them my way. Okay. Okay. Hey, everybody, thank you so much for joining. We're going to end the meeting now. Again, congratulations, Simone. Excellent presentation and uh, really looking forward to seeing it live in person at the gallery next weekend. Thank you very much for, uh, for everybody's time. Thanks for joining us. Uh, great to see you all uh, and take care. Oh, uh, one Thanks thing so before we leave, before the artists jump off, we just wanted yeah. to let you know that we do have our open call for artists on right now. Okay. So any artists on this call today, please um, check it out on the gallery submissions page. You can um, put a submission in for a solo juried exhibition and we do pay artist fees. So please take that into consideration. Okay, have a great day. Take care guys. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.